Welcome to the Taco Society Presents. Uh, we're here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for the uh, Anthicon uh, Convention of Dark and Speculative Fiction. This is going to be a reading from the New Hampshire uh, Writers Group. Uh, and Scott's going to tell us a little, about, a little bit about it. He's going to uh, talk about the uh, anthology that they've worked on, some of the members that have uh, written stories for it, the process of writing the anthology. Uh, and then he's going to tell us a little bit about himself. So why don't you uh, introduce yourself, Scott? Hi, my name is Scott Gowdsford. I'm one of the three coordinators of the New England Horror Writers, along with uh, Dan Cohane and Dave Price. Dan Price? No, Dave Price, sorry. Uh, we're here this weekend to, uh, I guess, celebrate and drop our new anthology, Wicked Tales. We have 20, 21 stories from our members and two reprints from Christopher Golden and Rick Houdela. And we've been around since about 2001. We were originally a spin-off of the HWA when they wanted regional people and they, they decided they didn't want regional people anymore so we just kind of took a file on our own and we've been HWA is the Horror Writers Association okay that's the uh, main branch that's the big one yet okay good about you know the, you, there was a New York branch and there was a Jersey branch and then they said let's do New England branch and then then you started that up no that was um, Mike Arruda and uh, L.L. Soares okay I think Dan Cohane was involved in that too gotcha and then they decided they didn't want us as regional branches anymore so they just said go away <laughs> and you took it over after that you I, I've been doing this about two and a half years two and a half years yeah now the anthology is you uh, David and Dan and Dan Cohen okay great uh, don't you show that I'm also in this uh, yeah. I have a story in TG's this. got a story in that yeah called uh, the pawn shop yeah yeah it's a great story and I recommend you buy it for that alone you should buy okay. 20 of them <laughs> <laughs> it's available on Amazon and print and Kindle let's talk about the uh, uh, the process to get this anthology going uh, you guys decide, hey, we're going to do an anthology. What do you do after that? It was kind of a spontaneous choice. One day we were talking, and it was like, you know what? Let's do another book. So we did an open call for any HW members only. And we made up a, basically we did made up a Gmail account and just opened up submissions for two and a half months. In order to get in the book, all three of us, Dan, Dave, and I, had to agree on the story. If two people liked it and one, people didn't want, one person didn't like it, it got cut. Yeah, and that's kind of And sad. that's what we did. Yeah. And at the very end, we had three spots left for 20 stories. So we all chose our top three stories, in which everyone's match we took, basically. Okay. And it took two and a half months just to go through the submissions. To go through the slush pile, and people have lives outside the <laughs> thing, so. We all have day jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so that took a little while, but we finally got through it all. And Dan did the layout, the cover art's by Ogmios, and the cover's brilliant. It's a cross between Weird Tales and Tales from the Crypt. And we wanted him to have, to have free reign on it, so we just said, take the book, this is what we want, go crazy with it. Good. Now, the submissions are done, what, what's the process? You all agree on it, what happens next? Uh, Dan does the layout, gets it into um, PDF form, it goes into uh, CreateSpace, then we upload it, we approve it, we have to get the approval from CreateSpace, we go through it again. Uh, we did the galleys, we sent the galleys back to the authors to make small corrections if any were needed. David and I did that, and then... Fill out the form, hit yes, and... And you got a book. And then I have magically 200 pounds of books in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Scott. Uh, cool. you're, you're an author. You've been an author for quite a while. How long have you been writing? Uh, I've been writing seriously since 92. I had my first paid sale in 96 of a story called Trailer Trash. And then I wrote a novel based on, on the short story, oddly enough, called Trailer Trash. And I've had about maybe three dozen short stories accepted to various anthologies over the air. Uh, my brother and I write these little non-fiction books. Plug, 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 plug. Um, horror Guide to Massachusetts. It's a geographical guide to where horror takes place in the state. Short stories, novels, movies, uh, some famous deaths, some folklore. Open up to a random page and just read a random city, uh, just so we can get a feel for uh, something short, something we can get a feel for what the book is about. Apparently, I opened up to the H.P. Lovecraft section. Let's. What the hell? Haverhill, Amesbury Road. John Greenleaf Whittier, 19, 1807 to 19, 1892, was born in the Whittier ancestral home of Amesbury Road, built in 1688 and now opened as a museum and literary shrine. The poet was the fifth generation of Whittiers born in the house. Although noted for his abolitionist activities and his poems celebrating rural life, Whittier also relished the good ghost stories, many of which are derived from his childhood haunts in East Haverhill. His poetry includes tales of witchcraft, the Wreck of River, Rivermouth, Changelings, The Changeling, and Ghosts, The New Wife, and The Old, which I'm writing a story based on right now. 
His first book was not poetry, but a study of local superstitions called The Legends of New England, published in 1831. He later went back to the topic in 1847 with the supernaturalism of New England. So the entire book is like that. This is an, an actual true fact. But if you want to go through to like Worcester, you could see that there were two X-Files episodes filmed in Worcester. Well, based in Worcester, filmed in Canada. And it's the same thing throughout the entire state. And the other thing about some of these uh, uh, stories, or I shouldn't say stories, but some of these uh, paragraphs uh, about the different towns, the sense of humor these guys impart in, in, in some of these entries are hilarious. Uh, so it's not just uh, sit down, read some facts. The, the, some of them put a smile on your face. So anything else you want to plug while you're, uh, you're right here? Uh, I've got a new novel coming out from Postmortem Press in August called Fountain, on, Fountain of the Dead. It's my zombie epic. Epic. <laughs> my novel Trailer Trash is being re-released from Great Old Ones Press in July and with a bit of luck, Once Upon an Apocalypse version, Volume 2, sometime in August. Which is another anthology. Another anthology. And you've got a horror guide to New Hampshire uh, on the on the boards anyway. Uh, it's on the boards right now. The, the next nonfiction book is Horror Guide to Florida. That should be out by September. Great. Well, thank you, Scott, very thank much. Thank you. Thanks we for having me. Well, we look forward to uh, uh, Scott's heading the panel. Uh, and we're going to have different uh, contributors to the anthology reading their stories. So uh, sit back, relax. I hope you enjoy the stories. And again, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm Scott with the New England Horror Writers. This is Dave, one of my co-editors. Uh, we're here to drop Wicked Tales this weekend. It's our third anthology. And we have a bunch of lovely, talented folks to help us out. So we're going to do some readings from the book. And uh, hope you all enjoy it. First up... Trisha Wooldridge. All right. Just leave that there. Okay. I should have said, do you want to say something? No, 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 Sorry. Right. I don't pick on Yeah, I thought you were going to pick on Dave. No. Nope. It's time to do that later. Okay. Uh, my name is Trisha J. Wooldridge. I have a poem in the book, and I practice. So you're not going to hear the whole poem. It's a story poem. It's probably one of the longest ones I've written. And I will read till uh, my favorite book hanger, and hopefully that'll... Make you want to buy the book? The Crocodile Below. There are no such thing as crocodiles living in sewers deep below. Don't believe in foolish monsters, child. You're a smart girl, Kaylee. You should know. Kaylee Ann Beecher walked to school every day, but told her dad she took the bus. Otherwise, he'd worry. They lived in a dangerous neighborhood. She knew so, because Jenny's mom said everyone should hurry. Lock car doors when you drive home. Don't you girls walk alone. That was when Kaylee and Jenny were still friends. But now Jenny was like the rest, taunting her and being mean. And Kaylee didn't take the bus, even in the snow when no one shoveled, walking home in her Salvation Army jeans. We'll feed you to the crocodile who lives in the sewer below. He's a wicked, hungry monster, wild. He'll eat you, Kaylee, don't you know? The old school where Kaylee went each day had a big old rusty chain fence. And on the other side of that fence, one might find murky water, trashed trees, and a circular sewer drain runoff. The kids were not allowed to play too close to that fence. Some parents, like Kaylee's dad, worried, but most didn't know if they'd even come to the school for parent-teacher night. It was already dark, concealing that dangerous hole the lair, of course, to where the crocodile stole. In that sewer, Kaylee, lives the crocodile. We'll throw you in that hole. You stupid, fat, retarded baby, cry. He'll eat you, you whore. Kaylee didn't know what a whore was, but it hurt. So when Jenny accidentally, on purpose, yanked Kaylee's braids during recess, she slapped Jenny hard and called her that. Then Jenny punched her back, and Missy and Tish and Leah, too, jumped in on the fight. The kids shouted, clapped, and cheered, till finally the teachers came. They broke the scuffle, telling them it was not all right. Parents were called, detention was full, but Miss Harrison was called away, ten minutes before the final dismissal bell. And the secretary she asked to keep an eye on them was busy talking on her cell. Jenny and Missy and Tish and Leah all turned on Kaylee. Oh, they would make her pay. We'll feed you to the sewer crocodile. There'll be nothing left but bones. He'll eat you up, that nasty crocodile. You'll be dead and no one will know. Four against one is never good odds. And in gym, Kaylee was always picked last. She hardly remembered the fight. 
They marched her outside, past the swings and the slide, through a hole in the corner of the fence. They marched her on down to the water so brown, so stinky, so gross, and so deep. It took only one push for Kaylee to fall, slipping, grabbing, rolling through shit and slime. She barely could swim, but she splashed to the rim of that scary sewer hole. She heard the girls laugh and saw their shadows running back toward the school. The dismissal bell was ringing, the buses would be waiting, and Kaylee was alone in this eerie, stinking pool. Where was that hungry sewer crocodile? Kaylee shivered, feeling cold. Dare she try to find home? It wasn't but three miles. But could she find her way out of this hole? Kaylee took out her flashlight. Daddy always said be prepared. So she packed one in her school bag, always just in case. She stepped through the water and stepped through the muck. Where she was going, she wasn't quite sure, but she looked for ladders heading up. And suddenly she heard a groan, followed by a growl, followed by a roar, and splashing and sloshing and crying. Words to use, she'd heard them all before. She'd boasted she killed the crocodile and more. Of course they didn't believe. Kaylee wavered and lowered her eyes and dragged her toe across the pavement as if scared where this conversation would go. Prove it, stinky girl, they ordered and called her more names, then punched her and pushed her and marched her back to the sewer, just as Kaylee had hoped they would. Beware of the sewer crocodile, he's more dangerous than you know. He'll burrow deep inside, lurk there a while, devouring everything you love and you know. Kaylee led her classmates down the ladder through the slime, splashing, wading, whimpering, crying, biding her time. Kaylee didn't hear the crocodile. Could she have imagined it? A terrible dream? I knew you were a liar, Missy steamed. Pissy for walking in those stinky sewer pools. Just wait till we tell our parents you'll be in trouble, banned from the school. Kaylee fought back tears, wiped dirty water from her eyes, and braced for the next bully blow. But then came Missy's scream. Silently he moves, the sewer crocodile. They all hunt in silence, you know. Soft as her water, then snap comes the smile. Down the gullet, in pieces you go. Leah didn't get very far, Kaylee splashed out of the way, eyes glued to Missy's floating, chomped off arm. Like Missy, only Leah's scream could escape. The crocodile lifted its great maw and crunched down, half of Leah's leg hit with a slushy splash, only inches from where Kaylee cringed, soaked in water and crocodile shit. I should run, Kaylee thought, too late, didn't move. Her flashlight reflected greasy scales of white, glistening and grayish like a blanket of maggots. It lowered its head and looked at Kaylee. Eye to eye, sickly pink pupil slit to wide, round, dark brown. It was not thankful for the food. It was not thankful for the care. It only wanted more. Kaylee said the only thing the crocodile would hear. I promise, I'll bring you more. <laughs> Rather than me running back and forth in front of the camera, I'm just going to take this and run over here. So next up we have Kristen Dearborn. Hello. I'm Kristen Dearborn. I'm going to be reading uh, my story from anthology. Uh, it's called Somebody's Darling, um, and it's based on a, inspired by a Civil War poem. So I'm going to read a little bit from the poem, um, which was written in 1864. Somebody's watching and waiting for him, yearning to hold him again to her breast. Yet there he lies with his blue eyes so dim, and purple, childlike lips half apart. Tenderly bury the fair, unknown dead, pausing to drop on his grave a tear, Carve on the wooden slab over his head, somebody's darling is slumbering here. When Captain Burr walked into the field hospital, Isabella instantly knew why he was there. She sat beside Sergeant Hopeman, who'd been blinded in a battle last month. She read to him from Silas Marner when things were quiet, which wasn't very often. Excuse me. She spoke in a low voice as she pressed the book to his hands and met Burr before he got too har far among the cots. When he took his hat off and pressed it to his blue-coated chest, she knew she was right. She hated being right sometimes. Miss Dimsdale, her heart clenched, 
and she couldn't smile the false smile she gave to the soldiers after they'd been wounded in battle. When they asked her if they would rise, and she promised them she'd make certain they stayed dead. Her father didn't want to be embalmed. It meant he would rise, and she pushed the thoughts away. They would become a reality soon enough. Burr ushered her into the tent where Dr. Irwin kept a small office. He gestured to a plain wooden chair, and she sat. He leaned against Dr. Irwin's desk. Her father was a few miles away fighting at Shiloh. Casualties began to arrive in the morning, the numbers gradually increasing. She'd searched each face she could, trying to make sure it wasn't him. Burr toyed with the brim of his hat, turning it over and over in his hands. When he spoke, his voice was hoarse. His face and uniform were dirty, stripes of sweat cleaving rivers of cleanliness around his temples. More gray infused his hair each time she saw him. She knew he didn't have time to be here, didn't have time to be telling her this personally. He was a great friend of her father's, and she supposed they'd owed each other this favor, whoever was unlucky enough to fall first in battle. It's your father. Isabella thought she'd been prepared, thought she'd steeled herself for the news. She didn't realize she'd been reserving hope, been bracing for the worst, so she could feel the sweet relief when Burr told her something else. She tried to speak, but it came out a whimper. He's bad off. He's alive? A great wave of hope crashed over her, made her dizzy. She gripped the arms of the wooden chair as she struggled to formulate a plan. Isabella, he won't live. I have to see him. Where is he? Burr nodded. Shiloh Church. I brought a wagon. Come along. She pushed past him and hurried to his wagon and climbed into the passenger seat before he could help her up. Burr clucked to the horses and took the wagon down the muddy, rutted road. The day was wet and mild, not as hot as it could have been. More heat meant more casualties. A private rode in the back of the wagon carrying a rifle. They drove in silence. Isabella worked her bank of medical knowledge, everything she knew as a nurse, all the little tips and tricks she could use to keep her father alive. They called them darlings. No one knew what started it, but the dead from this war between brothers didn't stay dead. People blamed voodoo from Africa, Appalachian cur curses, but no one knew how it began. Once they passed, the dead from this war rose, and each one of them had been somebody's darling. Fire stopped them, as did a bullet in the brain, or cutting off the head. And that's what they'd done in mass quantities until Thomas Holmes' embalming fluid began keeping dead men dead. Except her father didn't want to be embalmed. He said it went against God. His refusal meant he would rise. Isabella willed Burr to drive faster. One of the darlings lurched from a copse of trees, shambling towards them, tatters of a gray uniform clinging to his torso. The man in the back, barely more than a boy, raised his rifle. No, she called, because that would be her father soon. She had to reach father before he passed, talk sense into him. Once a person became like the darling shambling towards them, it was too late for Holmes's concoction. The private didn't listen to her. He raised his rifle and fired, hitting the darling in the eye. She wished there was another name for them. Every time she heard it, she wondered who might be missing them, who sat back home waiting for a letter that would never come. The corner of the darling's skull split apart, spattering brackish ichor and gray matter down into the muddy forest. Its knees buckled, and it fell straight down, paused for a moment as though it were praying, then collapsed forward onto its face in the mud. Isabella had seen worse. Burke hoaxed the horses on, pushing them harder and faster. The mud flew up in thick clots from the hoofs, and it sucked at the wheels, trying to slow them down. Isabella wheeled the wagon to go faster still. Other darlings lurched out from the trees, but the wagon moved at a good pace now, and the inhuman creatures impotently pinwheeled their arms and stumbled after them. Isabella watched. In the distance, she could hear the rumble of cannon fire. Her mother died when she was a girl. Her sister Susan married a Mormon and went to live in Salt Lake City. Her brother Jacob was one of the Union soldiers killed in the Battle of Camp Allegheny. Her father was her only darling. If she were gone, there would be no one to mourn him. Is it much farther, she asked. Not much, Burr, stole, Burr told her. She waited in silence, chewing at her lip until she tasted blood. From there to the church, she kept her eyes on her hands, folded in her lap. Once Burr slowed the horses, though, she flung herself from the wagon seat, her shoes slipping in the mud. She reached for the wagon to catch her balance, then ran for the door. Inside, she could hear the groans of dying men. Dr. Holmes wasn't here, but he'd trained surgeons to carry out his embalming work. 
Isabella had done it before a handful of times, holding the rubber ball as the arsonous acid flowed into the dead soldier's veins. They stayed quiet on the table. They almost passed for peaceful then, artificial color in their cheeks. They could pass for asleep unless, they saw, unless you saw the horrid gaping wounds. This war was not kind. She wanted closed eyes and ruddy cheeks for her father. He deserved eternal sleep, real rest. Isabella paused at the door. She turned to Burr, defaulting to him, letting him enter first. She followed, meek at his heels. She kept her eyes on the blood-stained wooden floor, not looking up at the faces all around. She couldn't bear to see them. Burr led her to the corner of the church, and she looked up. Her father was an imposing man. She hadn't had many suitors, but he had loomed over each of them, looking down at them and finding them all lacking. All they had in this world was each other. But she wouldn't have him long. She'd been nursing soldiers for almost a year now, and she recognized the glassiness around his eyes, the stink of blood and dirt, the gunpowder and sick. His breath stank, in indicating internal bleeding. He must be in great pain. She wished morphine for him, but knew they wouldn't spare it on a man who was so obviously dying. And I will leave that there. Nice. <laughs> So I'm going to mix it up now and do <laughs> Boys Against the Girls. Elizabeth Black, please read. Excuse it's been kind of shocking, you know. <laughs> That's what I do. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> hey, I'm uh, E.A. Black, and I'm in the book, too. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read from my story, Fog Over Mons. I don't know if you're familiar with the story, The Angels of Mons, from World War I. Um, uh, Google it. <laughs> That's the easiest way to find out about it. My story is based on the Angels of Mons legend, which took place during the Battle of Mons at, um, during World War I. And um, I'm going to read toward the middle of the story. And uh, basically, my main character is stuck in a trench with the rest of the British, and he's wondering if he's ever going to get home alive. Okay. I reached for my girl Violet's photo in my breast pocket and held it inches in front of my face. I focused on her loveliness, burning her image into my brain so it would be the last thing I'd see. She was my safe haven in this storm of bullets and mortars, the last thing I'd remember. Such sweetness and joy I'd never feel again. I knew I was going to die in this trench, bored by shrapnel with my gut strewn about me like tinsel. Despite my lack of faith, I prayed. I begged and pleaded with St. Maurice, the patron saint of infantry, please, St. Maurice, by whose by whose grace thy servants are unable to fight the good fight of faith and never prove victorious, protect us from evil. The smack on my shoulder startled me so much I pitched forward in the mud. I would have skewered whoever it was with, with my bayonet were it not for the hand that gripped the gun. Simsbury, get your yellow arse moving! I recognized my commanding officer, Second Lieutenant Bran Eilat, from the silhouette of his uniform and the disgust in his voice. I barely focused on his face. Every gunfire and shell exploding made me jump. I couldn't stop shaking. Coward that I was, I tried to hide, simply wishing for the pain and terror to stop. He shouted a few more words I could not hear. He shook me, but I held fast, frozen to the spot in sheer terror as my bladder threatened to empty all over my trousers. Lieutenant Eilat gripped me by my sleeve and dragged me down the trench. In the fog and haze from shell fire and rifle blasts, Stars burst before my eyes, blinding me as I stumbled and slipped in the mud behind him. My free hand followed along the wet walls, attempting to maintain balance but failing. The rifle in my other hand seemed a useless appendage. By the time he released my sleeve, he had dumped me in front of the remaining men. We were to rush out of the trench and, and in a last-ditch effort, mow down any German we saw. I gripped my rifle so hard my knuckles cramped and turned white again. I looked skyward. The same sickly maroon permeated the mist. The, the sun hung inflamed in the sky. The moon hid behind blood-red cloud curtains. Warm rain fell, smearing grease and oil on my skin and so soaking my uniform through until it felt as if it weighed 20 pounds. Each movement became more difficult than the last. The noxious, noxious scent that overpowered the stink of cordite shit and corpses littering our position smelled much worse by now. Hair on the back of my neck stood on end. We lined up, guns at the ready, prepared to rush over the trench. Most of the men muttered under their breath, their voices raised in prayer, some in song. All in unison, their voices carried to the heavens. Haro, haro, St. Saint Mo Saint Maurice, succor us. Heaven's night, aid us. St. Maurice for Mary England. A deafening howl filled the air around us as if a host of monstrous beasts 
had been disturbed from their slumber and shrieked in outrage. The sound of drums beat from far above. Strains of, of a blasphemous flute sung, sung from angry, angry clouds. I looked over the top of the trench. Lights unlike anything I had ever seen before flashed into the sky. They weren't flashes caused by flares, gunfire, or shells. They seemed to come from the heavens. The sound of war were replaced by the guttural screams of German soldiers appearing as a phantasm out of the mist right in front of our trench. Grotesque shapes appeared further in the mist out of the lights, dark gray wings beating against uh, a misted sky. Had the Germans decided to attack us as we were about to attack them? No, they looked disheveled, unprepared. One man still had shaving soap on his face. Had St. Maurice delivered us from evil after all? Before I had time to ponder the possibility, they poured into the trench, a dozen men acting as one. I recognized the uniforms, backpacks, gray jackets, pickle halb helmets, Germans. Without thinking twice, I lifted my rifle, bayonet aimed and ready to stab any alley man who came too close to me. All the men in the company li uh, lifted rifles and pistols, preparing for the inevitable attack. The Germans waved their arms about them, shouting words I could not understand, except for an endless chorus of bittas and hilfas. I cornered one against the dripping wall, my bayonet aimed at his throat. He only stared at me, mad and wild-eyed, begging me in foreign words I understood perfectly well not to kill him. He couldn't have been more than 14. How the hell did he end up all the way out here? Didn't anyone notice how young he was? Stand down, all of you, Lieutenant Eilatz yelled. Rigby, you understand what these Huns are saying? A bit, sir. Rigsby searched the frightened faces until he found their leader. He and the German conversed in staccato tones, and then he turned to the rest of us. Sir, they aren't here to attack us. They're fleeing the battlefield. Something about shining lights and something in the fog. We looked at each other, having seen the same thing, wondering what St. Maurice had unleashed upon us. Deserters? Lieutenant Eilat asked. Rigby shook his head. I don't think so. The German in charge spoke again, his voice shrill with terror. He repeatedly looked over his shoulder beyond the trench into the heavens. He pointed overhead. Amid his shrieking, I heard the word angle, angel. A crash resounded over the battlefield. At first I thought cannon fire, but it was far too loud and too high overhead. <coughs> I looked skyward and saw more light shining through the fog. What in heaven's name is that? I asked the young soldier at the end of my bayonet. He only shook his head, not understanding what I said. I nodded toward the sky, and he repeated what his leader had said. We, we are not here to harm you. The German leader's English could have used some improvement, but his message was clear. We hide. Run. He pointed toward the mist. Out there. Bad. No go back. Another crash, louder than the last. Howls of outrage from the heavens. Gunfire ceased immediately. A few shells exploded, but all was silent in moments. Even the injured ceased crying out in pain. The battlefield went more silent than the tomb it already was. Through the fog, I saw tentacles far overhead. I squinted my eyes tightly shut and opened them again to make sure I wasn't seeing things in the mist. My sanity strained as my eyes tried to decipher what, what stalked in front of me. A glimpse of large, luminous bodies broke my mind. Gigantic reptilian wings flapped so hard I felt the air whip against my face. These were unlike any angels I had ever heard of. They flew in the maroon mist, driving back Germans and English alike. Startled, I lowered my bayonet. The German boy in front of me did not run. He sank to the ground and curled up in a ball, unwilling to glimpse the evil that filled the heavens. It was then I understood what the German leader had actually been saying. It was not Engel. It was Engel de Todes, angel of death. We hide, German leader repeated. Please. I turned toward the young soldier who cowered at my feet, much the way I had cowered not long ago, in front of the mangled robins. I knelt on one knee and spoke, and spoke to him in a gentle voice. What's your name? He shook his head. I patted myself on the chest. Simsbury, Doug Simsbury, Heinrich Vogel. A cry came from the heavens and Vogel jumped. I grabbed my rifle without thinking twice about it, but as I watched the horror, I fell to the ground. As I watched the horror that fell to the ground, I knew my weapon was useless. Vogel was whimpering next to me, so I placed a hand on his shoulder in an attempt to calm him, to no avail. This boy could have been me. Thank you. Next up, we have Sorry, John McLevine. Yeah. <clears throat> and you all know him, so. Yes, I'm John McLevine. 
You see, it seeing we're limited in time, I guess I'll uh, read from a random spot. Uh, the end. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> All right, uh, my story is Eve. Um, I, what I thought was kind of neat, I just noticed that it follows Michael Zaruda's creative woman. And it seems, seems appropriate. It seems yeah. appropriate, yes. Uh, Eve. Guy read the text message. It was one simple word, not actually a word, but what had become the standard expression of boredom between him and his friends was uh, he had toggled the send button, responding with the same nonsensical expression when he felt the impact that tore the steering wheel from his left hand and sent his iPhone hurtling to the rear of the vehicle. Before he could make sense of what was occurring, the Escalade hit the guardrail and was enough force to catapult it over and land on its roof on the opposite side. The SUV slid another 50 feet, toppled over the embankment, and rolled seven times before coming to rest on the leafy forest floor, 60 feet below the highway. <clears throat> Guy lay on the hillside halfway between the roadway and his Escalade, launched through the shattered windshield to collide against a large spruce with jarring force. Guy opened his eyes, but he didn't move, not before assessing his condition. He felt no pain, which he found peculiar because he had remembered the forcefulness with which he, his body had hit the tree, and he could see the mangled scrap that moments earlier had been a late model Cadillac Escalade, only months off the showroom floor. He licked his lips and inhaled, no blood or difficulty breathing, only the earthy musk of fallen leaves in the early stages of an autumnal decay mingled with the smell of steam and antifreeze from the vehicle's fractured engine, which clicked and pinged as it cooled. Guy wiggled his extremities, flexed his arms and legs, and rotated his head on his neck. All seemed well, so he gingerly pushed himself into the sitting position, stood up, and bounced on the balls of his feet. He felt a moment of momentary elation that quickly dissolved into dread with the realization of just how deep a pile of shitty was had just gotten himself into. He had made only three payments on a $70,000 vehicle. Insurance would most likely contest it once they found out he was texting, and they would find out. They checked the phone records nowadays since texting accidents had become an epidemic. He considered reporting the truck stolen, but just as quickly dismissed it. He'd be caught in that as well. At least I'm sober, he thought, but it was a small victory. He was screwed any way he looked at it. May as well call 911, tell the truth, and face the music. The tumble down the embankment had jarred all the doors, jammed all the doors, excuse me, of the SUV except for the rear hatchback, which had folded onto the roof. Searching through the smashed windows, he looked for his phone but couldn't find it, and reaching beneath the seats only turned up remnants of shattered glass and other strewn items. He'd have to backtrack up the embankment and look for the phone there. If he couldn't find it, he could flag someone down from the roadway, if he could only find the embankment. Around him lay only forests, flat and dense with trees, endless oaks, birches, locusts, and maples in every direction, rising skyward on thick trunks, and one smashed up escalator. Guy knew this wasn't possible, but denial dampened his reaction. Hills don't simply disappear. There had to be a logical explanation, like shock or maybe delusions from hitting his head. That had to be it, because he couldn't, <clears throat> excuse me, because he thought he couldn't, <laughs> I, I know, my glad, I, my glad, sorry, I lost my place, because he <laughs> thought he could also see what looked to be a young girl moving along, uh, among the trees, about a hundred yards deeper into the woods. He were focused and sure enough, there, there she was. Long strawberry blonde hair falling halfway down her back and dressed in light blue overalls, overall shorts. She appeared to be riding or scraping something onto the trunk of a tree, but it was difficult to be sure from such a distance. Guy took a few hev hesitant steps toward the child and stopped. I gotta get close to the book, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, hey, little girl, Guy called. Hey. She looked up at and him indifferently and dutifully returned her attention to whatever she was doing. Guy started walking towards her, 
and when he had cut the distance in half, the girl moved to a tall elm about a dozen trees away from him. She deftly climbed the tree and propelled herself at the crux of a branch, nearly 60 feet overhead. There was nothing natural in it, the, the way she had ascended with the dexterity and ease of a squirrel. Guy had never seen anything like it from a human. He watched her for a few moments, wondering if she were avoiding him, but just as she but she just as deftly climbed back down and headed in another direction. Wait a minute, Guy said. The little girl stopped and watched him expectantly. She looked about nine years old, thin-limbed and fawn-like with vibrant blue eyes, but not strawberry blues as blue strawberry blonde as he had first thought, and attributed it to the play of sun to the trees. I got in an accident, Guy told her. I can't find my way out of the woods. I know girl responded, her tone neutral. She resumed walking. Guy followed, followed, duly concerned for himself and as to why a child her age would be alone deep in the woods. Are you lost, he asked. You're lost, she said, in the same impartial manner. She looked at him, her alert brown eyes reflecting him and their surroundings, and walked onto another tree. Brown eyes. Guy felt prickles of a knees run through him. They were there was no question that her eyes had been striking blue before she climbed the tree. He looked back at the Escalade trying to get his bearings so he could get the hell out of there, but the SUV was no longer in sight. He ran a few steps in the direction he had thought he had come from, but stopped feeling anxious by the idea of letting the girl out of his sight. Everything else he had, everything else he had looked away from had disappeared. He returned to where the little girl stood. She now had rich ebony skin, but the same light blue cover all, overall shorts, which Guy, Guy found even more disconcerting. Isn't it the clothes that have changed, not the child inside them, he thought? She seemed unconcerned, giving him the impression that she wasn't lost, which meant she was faring far better than he was. She again scribed something onto the tree. Guy moved beside her, feeling as if he'd fallen into the rabbit hole. Something's going on here, and I don't understand, he said to her. Something's always going on, she replied, matter-of-factly. I couldn't tell if she was disparaging or just answering him the same way most children her age would, but she was making him feel quite dense. Frustrated, he asked, can you give me a direct answer? I can, she pinned him, said, pinning him with glimmering green eyes. She skidded up the tree, spent five minutes high above, moving from branch to branch, and climbed down. I followed her 30 yards to a huge majestic oak, what are you doing, he asked. The girl now with straight, shiny, coal black hair to her waist started riding on the tree with what looked like a simple wooden stick. But as she moved, uh, moved it, the name Joey Wilkerson appeared as if engraving, as if engraved. Writing, she said. Writing what? Names. Who is Joey Wilkerson, Guy asked, understanding that his question would have to be precise if he wanted precise answers. A broken heart, she said, but offered no explanation. She, she again climbed a tree, moved from branch to branch. Guy, meanwhile, walked to a number of trees and saw that most of them had names engraved on them. Derek Aldenberg, Louise Rosios, Peter Craig, Harishoto Ishushima, Glenn Levake, and hundreds, maybe thousands more. She descended now wearing a mane of tight auburn ringlets. Are all of these broken hearts, he asked. Yep, she said, the simplistic word making her for the first time sound her age. Why are they all men, Guy asked, as he followed her to another tree. Boys too, she said, mostly boys. There aren't enough trees for the girls and women. Their names are on the leaves. And I'll leave it there. You better glasses, dude. No, no, I'm just so nearsighted. And, you know, we increased the font on that just for you. <laughs> <laughs> and rounding up the readers will be Rob Smales. Yeah. Yeah. I'm rounded Rob. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm going to be reading to you from my story, um, Keepsakes. I'm not reading from the beginning, so I kind of have to get you caught up in it. Um, it's a story of a 14-year-old boy who just moved to town. He's a new kid in town, and he's trying to impress his new friends by going to the garage sale that's being held by the 
creepy family in the neighborhood. Nice air quotes. There you go. <laughs> the creepy family in the neighborhood that everyone's afraid of. All right, he's going in there looking for this sort of local legend stuffed rat that they have. Not a toy, but like a, an actual stuffed rat. Um, so all by himself, he's going into the Eaves' house, to the garage. He stopped in the middle of the wide doorway, trying to see what lay ahead. The line between light and dark seemed absolute, however, and he could only see as far as the sunlight extended through the open door. A bright square on the cement floor lined along the far side by some stack boxes sitting next to a, the bottom half of a table. The place was silent, musty, and smelled of damp. He took a hesitant half step forward. Hello? We close in 10 minutes. Todd jumped at the rough voice blaring from the shadows beside the door. The woman shuffled into the square of daylight stabbing the darkness and the sudden sting of her cigarette smoke cut the moldy garage fuck assaulting his nose. What? The woman, Mrs. Eaves, he assumed, was small, just past his shoulder, and wore a black dress with puffy sleeves and a, a white rough thing at her neck. It's like some of those old pictures in history class, he thought. And is that a cigarette holder? It was a cigarette holder, the woman took from her mouth, the brown smoking stub stuck in the business end, smelling worse than anything Todd had ever experienced. And from her ragged voice, the woman had been using it for a long, long time. Be close. It's six o'clock. Ten minutes. It might have been the cigarette holder, but suddenly of those Rocky and Bullwinkle DVDs his father had gotten him when he was little popped into his head. Along with the villains in the show, Boris and Natasha, Russian spies with outrageous accents, and suddenly the words clicked. We close at six o'clock, ten minutes. I, uh, okay, six o'clock, right. He took a step back, trying to unobtrusively avoid the thick, reeking smoke that billowed when she spoke. I, I got it. Ten minutes. Done, be close. Brown teeth clicked on the cigarette holder as she stepped back, not turning, but staring straight at Todd and stepping back until she was swallowed by the shadows once more. The guys were right. Weird. Todd checked his watch. Nine minutes to six. I don't want to be in here any longer than I have to. But, excuse me, but do you have a... Hello? There was nothing but darkness where the old woman had been. There wasn't even a hint of a rancid cigarette smoke any longer. Unnerved by the woman's strange appearance and disappearance, Todd considered just getting on his bike and seeing if he could catch up with the guys before they made it all the way home. Then he imagined the looks on their faces if he showed up with the famed stuffed rat in tow. I've got nine, nope, make that eight and a half minutes till six o'clock. <laughs> Better hurry. Taking a steadying breath, it's just a garage, right? He stepped between a gap in the stacked boxes and into the deep blackness beyond. And as his eyes adjusted, found himself in what amounted to a narrow corridor between piles of stuff. Wow. Hidden in the shadows beyond the sunlight, tables and stands and boxes and stuff were piled higher than his head, much higher in places. He took a half step back as the wall of junk beside him, boxes stacked to a height of easily seven feet, each topped with some loose oddity, a desktop fan, a lamp, and strangely, a single boot, <coughs> appeared to lean in, looming over him. <coughs> he looked at the boxes in the stacks, at the bottom of the stacks, and in the dim light saw they crumbled somewhat, partially crushed beneath the weight of the upper junk. Jesus, he thought, they are leaning. One little nudge and this crap could fall. To his other side, stacked even higher, stooped another wall of stuff. Junk, packed together so tightly, he had to concentrate to see it as individual things. The whole mash of items tending to merge in his vision into a single mass of, well, stuff. He saw the edge end of a suitcase in there, a stack of books, and a big globe of the world like the one at the public library, all wedged between the obligatory cardboard boxes. In the middle of this wall, supporting much of it, 
was a big old refrigerator. The door marked Frigidaire. The huge engine's appliance seemed to make the wall sturdier, the piled jumble leaning in toward it rather than out toward him, but Todd still didn't dare touch anything. Just ahead was a big fish tank on a wrought iron stand, pushed endwise against the toppling wall as if bracing it. The glass tank itself was six feet wide and more than two feet high, and coupled with the three-foot stand, the fishy enclosure was already tall. Add on, to the, add on the row of packing boxes along the top, and the tank wall towered over him. The additional boxes packed in the open stand beneath the tank, giving it more solidity. He stepped up to the tank and peered inside, expecting to see fake coral and the water filter, maybe even some plastic plants like in his uncle's aquarium. Instead, he saw, neat as a pin, a row of wire coat hangers, hundreds of them lined up side by side and filling the bottom of the tank from end to end. He cupped his hands about his face, looked over the hangers through the tank rather than into it. In the open space beyond, a half-sized statue of a Spanish conquistador stood next to a low coffee table covered with stacks of shoe boxes. And behind them was yet another pile of close-packed junk. It's like a freaking maze, he whispered, reminded instantly of the television show Hoarders, a favorite of his mom's. As he pulled away from the glass, his watch caught his eye, and he pushed a button to light up the face. 5.53. Crap. Seven minutes. Seeving minutes, he whispered, then turned from the tank wall and moved deeper into the warren, peering all about him, searching for a rat shape in the shadows, which is actually where I was going to stop. Yeah. All right. Hi, right, once again, we're at uh, Anthrocon in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We talked to Scott, uh, and he mentioned uh, David Price, who's his uh, co-editor, uh, and also worked on the ecology, and I just want to introduce David. Uh, how you doing, David? Good, how you doing, Tony? Great, great. How was the uh, whole experience for you uh, putting the anthology together? This, it was an amazing experience. This is the first anthology that I've ever worked on, and, you know, working with a closed group of people that I knew was very difficult to select stories and turn people away. That must be the hardest part, the rejections. It, it was very hard. Luckily, Scott handled that end of it. <laughs> Even though we voted, Scott yeah, handled they, the they notices. They dumped that on me, yeah, but... But so, he's got a little more experience yeah. with that. But um, I think we really assembled an amazing collection of stories here. Good. Um, we got very lucky with the cover, too. Yeah. Um, Scott talked to Ognios, and he was within our budget. And I think we came up with an amazing cover. It really fit my vision for a Bernie Wrightson... EC Comics kind of cover, mm -hmm. and um, oh, it looks great. Yeah, yeah. he did. A, he did a great job. And, and the content, it really can't be beat. I wish we could have had more stories from some of the people who submitted. You know, in the end, so much space and so much money, you, you can you know dump into the book before you're over budget and paying out of your own pocket instead of the bank account. Yeah, yeah. but if, if well, that's going to happen anyway. So. Yeah, <laughs> but if you get a happen. chance to read it, you won't be disappointed. There's a lot of great stories. Great. Tony got us a lot great story in there too. You know. Oh well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what David Price writes and, and what's available from uh, from you? Okay, well, I have a novella out called Dead in the USA. Yeah. Um, it's a kind of a ghostly revenge story set in Boston at the time that they were building the new Boston Garden. Ah, okay. And then I have some short stories out in various anthologies. Okay, is it all horror? Yes, all horror. Okay. I'm working on a fantasy novel that I do not have published yet. Okay. Well, we wish you luck in that, and uh, thanks again for working so hard with Scott. Uh, and Dan on Wicked Tales. All right, great. Thanks for yeah. time. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, we're back at Anthrocon. Uh, we're talking just to uh, a, a, another author or two here uh, who did not participate in the readings and may not be in the anthology. But while they were here, I thought I'd just grab them and introduce you to them, hopefully for uh, some future reading for you. Uh, this is Matt. Matt, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you write and what you, what you, get, what you have published. Okay, uh, my name is Matthew Bartlett. Uh, I actually do have a story in Wicked Tales, uh, Master of Worms it's called. Um, and my first book uh, is called Gateways to Abomination. It's uh, uh, kind of a, a bunch of stories all centered around the theme of a uh, spectral radio station and the broadcasts. Uh, oh, cool. So the book consists of the broadcasts themselves and then some stories about how the broadcasts affect 
people who hear them. Cool. Uh, cool. My next uh, second book just came out uh, called The Witch Cult in Western Massachusetts, which is a uh, sort of mini uh, fictional biographies, each accompanied by uh, an illustration. And that's available now? That is available now, here at Anthocon and on Amazon.com and okay. various, wherever I am. It's wherever available. you are. That's right. Okay, well, we're going to say it's available on any online realtor. realtor. That'll do. That works. You have to say that. It's available at any online uh, retailer. Great. I almost said realtor. Real it's not a book. No, not it's house. not real estate. <laughs> no, no. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Thank you. We wish you all the luck in the world. Yeah. Hi, we're back here at uh, Anthicon. I've probably said that two or three times now. Uh, and they just can't get rid of me. That's right. <laughs> I'm like a roach. We're, we're here with Scott and, and Tricia, uh, who's also in Wicked Tales, and uh, hopefully you've heard her story. Uh, if not, we're going to introduce you uh, to her now anyways. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your relationship with Scott, and the, uh, this, your, your uh, contribution to Wicked Tales. Okay. Um, well, I've been a member of New England Horror Writers for many years. I met Scott at one of the first Brock and Chucks that I went to. He was running the table. And I know we hit it off pretty well, my friends. And we both do events. I do events for Broad Universe, which is a feminist organization that helps women who write science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And I've been writing a long time. Um, most of my stories tend to be dark and evil and have magic. And I also tend to um, have evil things with children, but... <laughs> How long have you been writing? Um... Honestly, since kindergarten, I would bring home my, like, sentences and say, Hey, Mommy, I got new verb sentences. <laughs> so I've always been writing. I've been getting paid to write. Um, actually, I got paid to write in high school. So yeah, Journal I did journalism. I did um, all of that, too. So food right. writing and all of that. And what have you got available if people are interested in... Uh... Um, so besides my, my story about bullying <laughs> in uh, Wicked Tales, I also have uh, three children's books out which uh, two are set in Scotland and they are going around the Scottish uh, fairy legend of the Kelpie, which is a child-eating fairy horse. And the story is about the 11-year-old girl who decides she really doesn't want to deal with a child-eating fairy horse and stands up to it. And the other children's book that I have is Silent Star Song. And that one is another um, rather precocious 11-year-old who's uh, supposed to be able to hear the future from the songs and the stars, but she was born deaf, so she's considered a failure. And it's her journey of finding her way to the future that the stars hold for her. Great. Oh, it sounds like you're very productive and prolific. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, thanks again for uh, you. your reading today, and hopefully yes. uh, we will see this uh, uh, on this episode. Hi, right, while we're interviewing uh, horror authors here, we'll, what would I like to do now is interview... Uh, or at least introduce you to uh, Elizabeth Black, mm -hmm. and uh, she's one of the authors that hopefully you've uh, uh, seen here reading, <laughs> <laughs> reading uh, uh, from from the uh, anthology Wicked Tales, and uh, Scott, uh, you've known Elizabeth for a while. I met Elizabeth last year at at the the last anthocon we were all at mm -hmm. together. Oh, great! So coming to these conventions can also set up some sort of. Uh, Networking. It's it's definitely the the smaller shows like Anthocon and Econ that they're they're not really big sales shows. They're more for interacting with people and meeting other writers and, and authors and just networking and just one to one. hanging out with people. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm assuming you get to sit down, and have a drink, maybe talk with them at dinner or lunch Absolutely. or breakfast. Get to know them a little bit, what they write, how they write, and see if it's a good fit. And then when you have a anthology that's open, uh, meaning an open call, anybody can submit to it. If you know the person, not that you'll pick that because you know them, but it just gives them a little edge. It's, right. It's a little, well, I, I know. And it also makes like. it a little bit harder in case the story doesn't quite fit what we're looking for. So once you, no? <laughs> once you get the personal relationship, it's just like, eh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it gets yeah. difficult. The dreaded rejection yeah. slip. But uh, we're going we're gonna to talk to Elizabeth for uh, a minute here and uh, find out more about her. Uh, why don't you tell us about uh, uh, what you write and who you are and what, and what you do. Okay, um, well I write both, uh, actually I write horror, dark fiction, erotic romance, and erotica. And I try not to combine them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but um, I mean, I, I'm in here with uh, Fog Over Mons, which is based on the Angels of Mons legend from World War One, And I started writing about 2007 when I, I wrote uh, an erotic version of Cinderella, what happened after she married the, ma the handsome prince. 
and uh, things didn't go too well for her. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> but you do write a lot of horror. Yes. And that's why we're here, yeah. and uh, that's why you're reading. Mm -hmm. Have you got any horror novels or horror stories coming um, out soon? I have no, no horror, well, there's a horror story coming out possibly with stupefying stories once they get the new issue together. Okay, and that one great. is called, um, um, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unrequited, yeah. There I have to go. keep track of all these stories. It's tough yeah. when you have a lot of stories mm -hmm. out there and we laugh that mm -hmm. you can't remember, but all of us go through that. If someone says, what's the name of that story you wrote two mm -hmm. years ago? Mm -hmm. And you, you have to stop, you have to think. And sometimes you can't even remember the anthology, you know, mm -hmm. never mind the, the story. Oh my God, what was it in? It was a big book. <laughs> I have to keep a spreadsheet yeah. of all of everything mm -hmm. now because I, I just forget stuff yeah, daily. It, it's easy to do. And if you've got over a dozen stories mm -hmm. published, uh, it, it makes it difficult to remember. Well, my most, uh, I get my most recent story is Infection in Teeming Terrors. And uh, that's, it's about a, a man in a hospital who has an infection that isn't quite what it appears to be. Oh, geez, that sounds like a great horror premise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you again, well, thank Scott. You thank you. Uh, thank you. We, we appreciate the time and the reading, and uh, we, we wish you all the luck with the anthology. Thank everyone. you. Right. And I'm just going to plug the con real quick. Um, the, the guys who run Anthocon every year are Mark Wally, Tim Deal, and Johnny Morris. They do a great job at the show. And they do a magazine called Shroud Magazine out of Milford, New Hampshire. Pick up four or five copies. It's a great little book. It really is. It is. We can't can't say enough. All of us have been talking this weekend about how good uh, uh, this particular year was. Not that the other ones are bad, but this was spectacularly uh, well run. Support your small press. Support your local authors. Preach, 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 et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, the next con we're going to will be Nikon, and that's in six weeks. And six hopefully weeks. we'll have some, yeah, hopefully we'll have some... Uh, video and footage, maybe a panel instead of readings uh, from uh, Nikon. Thank you very much and thank you for watching and hopefully you'll uh, see us again soon. Thank you. Thank you.